Hello, this is Dr. Carney, and this is a introduction to literary theory and criticism, part one. So a lot of this material is going to come from the introduction to Terry Eagleton's uh, literary theory and introduction, the introduction to an introduction. Um, it's about what is literature. This question of what is literature is not as uh, straightforward as we tend to think. Um, so multiple answers to this question, and there's um, going to be criticisms of almost all of those answers. So what is literature? Several answers. First off, it's artful language. Um, it's a language that we've um, strategically done violence to. You think about um, the syntactical, syntactical changes of like a Shakespearean monologue or um, you know a sonnet or the formal elements, the conventions of a sonnet. Uh, it's not just everyday normal discourse, conversation with friends, ums, ahs, this and that, how I'm talking right now. Uh, literature is deliberately formed, it's deliberately artful, that's what makes literature literature. Um, but uh, people will criticize this because, um, you know, what about the plain style? There's some works that we will call literature that are defined by their transparency, their directness, their um, lack of ornament. Uh, you know, coming to mind, two writers I'm really interested in are George Orwell and uh, John Steinbeck. Both of them began as journalists and uh, became literary artists after their career in journalism. So they wrote in such a way to um, avoid any sort of ornamentation. So artful language, maybe, but not always the case. How about when we call something literature, we're making a value judgment. We'll say, oh, Shakespeare's literature, but R.A. Salvatore's, uh, you know, Dristu Erden, um, you know, Dark Elf, Dungeon Dragons novels, they're not literature. Um, but that's that's fair. We, you know, I think some people are, are comfortable with saying Pulitzer Prize winning novels are literature, but, um, you know, Pulp Fiction from the 1930s is not literature. Most people are, I guess, intuitively okay with that. But these value judgments vary and are, are not subjective. Um, also, you know, they're um, temporally myopic, right? Sometimes stuff that was considered garbage in the past, not literary in the past, will become literature as it ages. A good example is Shakespeare's plays. We all know that Shakespeare's plays were um, popular entertainment. Um, I'm not a Shakespearean scholar, so I, I'm, I'm sure there are nuance and, and subtle distinctions that can be made there, but his sonnets were considered the, the, um, the works with, the, with artistic ambition, not his plays. But his plays, I think, have endured in a way, and, and they're, they're going to be considered literature in a very specific way that perhaps they weren't considered literature when they were created. So even the concept of literature as a value judgment is um, difficult uh, to uh, believe in in this um, naive way. Um, some people will avoid these two, uh, you know, um, criticisms of uh, what is literature by saying, well, it's, it's actually not a thing. Uh, literature is actually an activity. It's an enterprise. It's a, a way of reading texts, right? It's a, um, it's a way of relating to literary forms. You can read anything in a literary way. Um, you can invest attention in any text in a literary way. Um, the problem with that is, you know, anything can become literature then. Right? It uses all. It loses all usefulness. You can apply um, close reading. A term close reading refers to um, the, an academic way of reading literature. You can do close readings of cereal boxes. You can do close readings of ephemera. Um, you know the um, coupon books that you get in the mail that you throw away. Right. You can you can do um, deploy literary theory on those things. So literature as a category starts to lose all um, you know, relevance. One. Uh, a thesis of what literature is that I find pretty convincing is literature is ideology, and that term is uh, you know it's, it's it has a long intellectual history. We'll spend some time in the class going over it, but ideology basically means socially constructed convention, and specifically it's a it's a constructed convention in such a way that it's it appears to be natural. It becomes ideological when you don't even question it, right? Literature is just one of those things where some people will say, "I know it's literature when I see it," you know, but um, um, that for, for me means it's ideology. Let me uh, back up a little bit. Um, when, when, when we pretend like it's just natural and we would never question it. Um, but this category, if, if we we're okay with um, literature being ideology, then if, if, you know, when we look at the history of and, and the, and the um, uh, theory of ideology, then what ideology does is it serves to reproduce the social order. Right? It's, it's the ideas that we've incorporated to make sure that we're all getting along, that's, that, that the economy is um, proceeding without any sort of uh, problems, you know, that nobody's fighting each other and political um, 
you know, power is transferring in this peaceful way. That's what ideology does is that it allows for you know, societies to function. Uh, if literature is also ideology, then it serves to reproduce the dominant order. And what does that even mean? What literature serves to reproduce the dominant order? I mean, it's a, a very big conversation um, we're gonna have, but uh, I, I like the idea of this. Um, this is a really good example. Um, this picture here is Dr. Eliot's five foot shelf of books. Um, a, you know, the president of Harvard was uh, Charles W. Eliot. And in 1919, he had this idea that, um, you know, a gentleman's education, uh, a humanities education did not require a college degree. It just required five feet of space on a, um, a bookshelf and it, it would incorporate a certain uh, you know a list of, of, of works that he thought were relevant so he actually curated this list of, of uh, classic works of world literature speeches and historical documents but once again this is going to be serving you know George W. Eliot um, I, I don't know a lot about his life but but um, I'm pretty sure he was not he, he, he was a well-off guy he was um, you know the president of one of the great universities um, his view of what's valuable that you know literature contains values it, it, it contains um, a prescriptions about how to live he's providing this this lens you know for um, you know how to how to uh, you know comport yourself in the world right like so when you when you believe that uh, George W. Eliot's view of what counts literature and what doesn't count as literature when when that's your uh, model uh, you're, 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 you're kind of um, uh, basically being obedient to a dominant social order. I'm not sure if that makes sense as a complicated idea, but but we'll um, talk more about it later. Um, but but that, uh, neither here nor there, all sorts of questions of what is literature, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, there are some common assumptions that we uh, take to literature. Um, for example, we tend to think that literature has uh, a deeper meaning, a uh, surface content and a hidden content. Part of what you do in a in a academic literary studies class is you're reading text for hidden meanings. Sometimes it really annoys people to um, read text for hidden meanings. Like the, it sets up this authority of the professor has the answer and the student is trying to figure out the riddle of the text. It turns literature into like trivia night, right? Um, I would argue, you know, one of the questions that we can ask about this, this assumption is, uh, is this always true, right? Are there texts that always have this surface and latent content? Some texts are written so that they're just supposed to be read and, and you know, an experience in this direct way. There's a whole school of literary uh, um, theory now called surface reading that kind of uh, resists this notion that you, we should be looking beneath the surface of text. That that the surface of text is actually what we should be focusing on. We also tend to believe that if it's literary, it merits sustained attention. Rereadings, even. Um, Italo Calvino, who's a um, writer, literary um, critic, very thoughtful guy. Uh, his um, definition of a literary classic is one that merits rereading. You know what 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 counts literature? It's those works that re that that for this reason and that um, you you need to reread them. You know Dostoevsky, for example. Um, we often uh, but are, are there exceptions? Um, are there uh, are, are there works that that are that count as literary that don't merit rereading or even sustained attention? Um, I think it was uh, Woody Allen who said classics are the works that everybody intends on reading but never reads, right? So is it enough that War and Peace is kind of celebrated, uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace is celebrated as a great work of literature, is it enough that it's celebrated and not that we actually read it, right? Um, perhaps, I don't know. Um, you know, it, another assumption we bring to literature is that it is ethically insightful and morally educational. It makes us better. Uh, we sustain, uh, I, I should say, we invest these um, you know this uh, amount of attention to these texts because hopefully there's something in there that's not just entertainment, right? They make us better. But is this always true? Right? Um, are there exceptions? Um, sure, Charles Dickens, uh, The Christmas Carol, is going to teach us about industrialization, child labor, how we should um, cultivate relationships with our uh, fellow human beings. But does that apply to a lot of science fiction texts, a lot of um, horror texts, a lot of fantasy texts? There are there are texts that are uh, purely escapist, right? That that aren't about making you better. Um, that aren't activist in in, in intention. Um, and is is it is it fair to kind of demand that all uh, literature uh, does this sort of um, you know moral betterment, moral education? Another assumption that we have is that uh, literary texts merit being preserved, merit being curated. There should be critical editions, and they should be protected from censorship. If it's literature, don't cut anything out. But is this always true? Um, sometimes we we do fiddle with text because perhaps some of the language is harmful. Perhaps some of the um, uh, 
ideas contained in the text are harmful. Um, you know, the, uh, in American literature, there's a lot of debate about, um, you know, uh, the N-word in, in, in literature, like literary texts, like should it be excised? Perhaps it be included, but X'd out. You know, th th these are questions that people are, um, you know, are having about, for example, Mark, Mark Twain's, a lot of Mark Twain's novels have that word in it. Um, I just put the Hemingway's iceberg theory up here because a lot of our ideas of surface and um, uh, depth, right, um, come from, not directly, but I, I think Hemingway's iceberg theory, Hemingway um, had this uh, passage from Death in the Afternoon where he said, and I'm gonna read this passage, if a writer of prose knows enough of what he is writing about, he may omit things that he knows. And the reader, if the writer is writing truly enough, will have a feeling of those things as strongly as though the writer had stated them. The dignity of a movement of an iceberg is due to only one eighth of it being above water. A writer who omits things because he does not know them only makes hollow places in his writings. So people have taken this passage and, and, and other comments from uh, Hemingway to, you know, even though Hemingway has this very Spartan minimalistic pro style there's much more there there's implied elements right this you can see the tip of the iceberg but beneath the a water line you have the the, the depths um is does that hold for all literature uh, uh maybe not um well but if you do believe that literature has surface and depths then you have to believe in something called uh interpretation right interpretation um is you know, the analogy of a, an oracle speaking in riddles, right? You go back to the ancient world, the oracle starts to spout nonsense. There's a priest nearby. The priest interprets what uh, the oracle is saying. That's kind of what we do to literature texts because of the assumptions that we bring to these texts. So um, if we assume literature, poetry, drama, and film have a surface and hit, a hidden content, then we necessarily see literature as something that needs to be explained. Um, is this true? Are there exceptions? I think a lot of people will, will say perhaps there are exceptions. Um, and this is a point of uh, historical curiosity, I think. Uh, literary interpretation arguably comes from a, a school called a hermeneutics, an intellectual um, a tradition called hermeneutics, which actually is uh, analysis of sacred texts, specifically biblical texts. So a lot of our close reading uh, um, practices come from um, how we would approach uh, literary text. There's a, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, and he had a, a theory of biblical exegesis, how, uh, you know, the Bible creates meaning. And for him, there were multiple levels of meaning in biblical text. There was the, you know, the literal interpretation of the Bible was just one uh, element. There were three other elements. Um, they were all consistent for Aquinas, but he, he kind of uh, teaches the Western reader how to, you know, find meaning uh, in uh, different ways. And my question is, do we treat literature as a sacred text when we're reading it? Is this comparison apt? Is it mistaken? Lots of questions. Well, uh, literary interpretation is um, what you do if you are a literary critic. Uh, people get hung up on this term criticism. So like, what is literary criticism? Criticism is not finding fault. It's not even really judging, although part of literary criticism is judging the merits and flaws of a work, but that's not the main thing. Analysis is the main thing. Um, so I, says, uh, I say here, uh, criticism in the context of literary studies refers traditionally to the analysis and judgment of the merits and faults of a work. If that's how we define literature, then our informal conversations about favorite shows with friends, a form of uh, criticism, when uh, you know, you're leaving the movie theater and you're talking to each other about that movie sucked or that movie was awesome, are you guys engaged in a form of criticism? Perhaps. Um, are newspaper book reviews a form of criticism? You know, book reviews, film reviews, tend to have a, a, a user value. Their function is to tell you if you should read, uh, if, if you should buy this book or not, if you should spend money on a ticket to go see this movie or not. Um, that's not always what critics are doing. A lot of times critics, they're not really concerned about whether or not you should read it or not. Um, they're concerned with analyzing it. That's different. They're, they're not focused on giving you information about is this worth your time they're they're interested in analyzing the work itself question is it the critics responsibility to judge the artistic merits or faults of a work they're analyzing or does analysis sufficiently satisfy their responsibility um, a lot of people get hung up that like it is the critics responsibility to, to, to judge you know to make sure this is good this is bad but in academic literary criticism very few people spend time on judging works. A lot of times it's because they're working on canonical texts, and that term canonical is loaded, but canonical means that it's already been decided that this is worth our time. 
right? If we're actually doing an academic study of this, of, of Frankenstein, right? The question of is it good or bad is kind of irrelevant, right? It's, and who are you, one critic, to say it's good or bad when clearly there's a consensus that this work endures? Now, that, that, of course, there are always going to be retrospectives. Should we, re, uh, anal should we uh, rethink the canon as it stands? Are there certain people who have been um, you know, pushed out who should be incorporated? But that's separate from this idea that, like, is it the responsibility of a critic to, to judge the merits or the flaws of a work? And then finally, like, what is the relationship between criticism and interpretation? Interpretation, arguably, is what critics do. And this sets up this role of the critic as like a, you know, once again, this priest figure, like, who has this authority to tell you what it means. And I'm suspicious of that, um, of that view of the critic, because I don't think that the critic necessarily has um, an authority, right? Um, where does this authority come from? How do I know what the text means? And also, um, there's the issue of the intention of the author. A lot of times with living authors, the authors will say, that's not what I meant at all. And so then we have to uh, find parity between that. Like, can we ta say to an author, it's irrelevant what, what, what you say. And some people, um, Roland Barthes has an essay called The Death of the Author. And it's, 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 um, there's, there, there's a lot of uh, moves in that argument that um, it's not just we have to ignore the author, right? But it's that, you know, um, sometimes what an author says about their work is not, not very relevant. Uh, that's a big idea, um, and I'm, I'm sure people are like, oh, you know, I have uh, thoughts. But m moving on, so this is a class on uh, literary theory. So what is literary theory, and, and how is it different than literary criticism? Uh, well, to, to start, literary theory is often contrasted with literary criticism. It's, it's a different enterprise. It's viewed as two distinct and separate intellectual um, enterprises. So um, they differ in aims. Uh, so what are the aims of literary criticism? An example would be an analysis of Hamlet. Right? A literary critic wants to understand Hamlet. Now they might use literary theory to make their analysis of Hamlet more substantive, more insightful, but their goal is to illuminate Hamlet. Right? They're, they have a laser bullseye focus on Hamlet and understanding that text. What are the aims of literary theory? Uh, an example would be a philosophical meditation on the function of tragedies. A literary theorist would would deploy Hamlet as an example to get to what they're actually wanting to focus on, which is why do we go and see tragedies? Why do we like to see the spectacle of, you know, um, people's dreams being shattered, people poking out their eyes because they slept with their mother? It's Oedipus reference, right? Why do we go and see these horrible tragedies? You know, in that case, it's not about understanding Hamlet; it's about understanding this kind of more theoretical issue of. What is the function of tragedy? So that's a really important distinction. Literary criticism is focusing on the text itself, trying to come to some sort of understanding of the work. Literary theory has a related issue, and it's often using literature to come to this understanding. Now, that distinction doesn't always hold. There are um, kind of works that do both at the same time. But, uh, but it, it, it's a useful distinction. I have some examples up here. Um, Postmodernism or The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism by Frederick Jameson. Jameson uses uh, a lot of postmodernist art and literature and architecture um, as examples, but his goal is not so much to illuminate those texts as to, you know, just you know, come to some sort of understanding of what is this phenomena of postmodernism that um, philosophers have been talking about. So his aim is to illuminate postmodernism. Uh, we have a uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus: Capitalism and Schizophrenia. It's a really compelling intellectual enterprise. Um, they're uh, reevaluating how Western philosophy is done and organized, and uh, they have a different uh, metaphor for knowledge. Right, where we used to use the tree of knowledge, they want to, um, you know, substitute that for uh, the uh, rhizome, um, the potato uh, roots. It's really interesting. Um, but uh, and they use literature and they use art and other um, texts to kind of come to this understanding. But once again, their goal is a theoretical um, in insight rather than a. Um, they're not necessarily trying to um, illuminate a particular work of art. Uh, so these are our two examples of theory. Um, on the uh, right here, you have uh, Ian Watts' The Rise of the Novel. He's going to use um, philosophy and the history of ideas to talk about uh, the rise of the novel, but he really wants to understand Defoe and Fielding, you know, these uh, early 18th century novels that uh, did some really interesting and innovative things. Um, you know, for example, Robinson Crusoe's, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, the drama 
in that is trying to find things like food and shelter and um, you know setting up an agricultural program, right? Those compare those to like the medieval romances that came before, where you would have knights and giants and uh, you know sorcerers and uh, wizards in in distress, right? Uh, something has changed once you get this new novel form. It tends to focus on what would hitherto have been considered mundane, and now it's dramatic, right? Um, Watts trying to see where that comes from, but he's once again he's, his his focus is on understanding a literary form. I, I couldn't help but be an egomaniac and put my own book up here, um, Weird Tales of Modernity: The Ephemerality of the Ordinary. Um, I'm concerned with uh, literary history um, when we tell the um, history of the story of the history of early 20th century literature. We tend to focus on literary modernism and we leave out uh, pulp fiction. Um, I think that's a problem. But so what I try to do in this text is, um, in, in this monograph, is um, I look at the uh, history of uh, early 20th century literature, and I and I bring in Lovecraft and uh, Robert E. Howard, another pulp writer, and uh, Clark Ashton Smith, another pulp writer, and I try to show how they're doing some very similar things that the modernists were doing, and that when we tell the story of, of early 20th century literature, we need to have a more hospitable um, uh, view. A lot there, but uh, so so we have a good distinction between literary criticism and literary theory. But there's some other terms that get bandied about. What is um, cultural theory? Cultural theory is, uh, maybe it's like uh, 40 years old, 30. There are specific moments where we can uh, point to when cultural theory uh, emerges and it starts being used in this way. But it basically is when people realize that literary theory uh, doesn't just have to be, uh, isn't just useful for applying to literary text, but it can also be applied to anything, right? Any form of human expression, any cultural artifact, right? Um, you know, film, television, popular culture, fashion, ephemera, right? That's, you're doing cultural theory if you're using the body of, uh, the body of literary theory um, and you're applying it to other things other than literature. Um, I have this example of the creation of narrative in tabletop role-playing games, and I have an example of the um, uh, most recent issue of the Journal of Popular Culture. You know, if you look at the, um, well, first off, the creation of narrative in tabletop role-playing games, this is, um, it's an academic work. It's highly theorized. There's going to be references to narratology in here, um, but it's just looking at role-playing games, how, how a story is created around the table when you're playing D&D. The Journal of Popular Culture, there's articles in here about um, uh, all Stranger Things. There is an article about um, the, uh, I'm, I'm looking, um, uh, the, 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 um, so apocalyptic television, um, so gig economy, right? Things like Uber and... Um, you know, uh, a lift, right? All these, you know, if you look at the um, the Journal of Popular Culture's table of contents, very few of these are actually looking at literature, but they're deploying a lot of interdisciplinary cultural theory. So now that we know what cultural theory is, there we, we should offer a few caveats. There's a couple of terms that sometimes get um, confusing because they're so close and they're kind of abstract. Critical theory and cultural studies, two very separate things. They're related. Some one could say critical theory is a precursor to cultural theory, but critical theory refers to a specific um, German uh, and then later American, um, you know, intellectual uh, group association. Uh, it was uh, it started by this um, Karl Grunberg, um, a Marxist professor at the University of uh, Vienna, and um, you know, uh, famous associates of the uh, of the um, Institute for Social Research were. Uh, you know um, Adorno and Horkheimer, um, names that you should uh, familiarize yourself with. Interested in critical, uh, in critical and cultural theory, um, they applied um, ideological critique to uh, uh, you know things like Disney movies and uh, you know television and um, radio drama, right? So um, one of the first uh, instances of cultural theory. Uh, cultural studies actually refers to a, a, a British school, the Birmingham School of Cultural uh, Studies, founded in the '60s. Um, and it's associated with uh, critics like Raymond Williams, very important name to um, uh, know about if you are um, in interested in um, how the British have applied uh, literary theory to popular culture. Is uh, Raymond Williams actually was interested in class distinctions and how culture is, is often an, uh, an attempt to kind of um, bring people into a certain socioeconomic class. Like you know, when we try to get people, working class people to read Shakespeare, you know, there's something going on there that's not quite, we just want people to experience Shakespeare. There's, there's something else happening, right? Like it has to do with power and, um, you know, uh, obedience and this and that. Stuart Hall is another big name associated with the British School of Cultural Studies, but critical theory and cultural studies to summarize um, 
is uh, distinct from cultural theory. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that cultural theory reminds us that theory is interdisciplinary and intellectually diverse. It's not just um, we're going to read about the theory of tragedy and apply it to um, Greek tragedy, right? It's it's not that simple. It's the, the, it's it's all sorts of different interdisciplinary theories: sociology, psychology, um, political economy, um, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, uh, gender and sexuality. All of these things are going to be talked about, and they're going to be applied to a diversity of texts, not just literature, but um, games, you know, uh, television. I remember reading an article in the journal Popular Culture about Muzak, right? Um, artificially uh, intel uh, algorithmically generated music that plays in elevators it's really interesting here's some other examples of a uh, kind of cultural theory I, I think um, you know we have the JAC uh, um, table of contents but here's this um, giant creatures in our world essays on kaiju and American popular culture it looks really cool and we're all infected essays on AMC's The Walking Dead and the fate of the human um, two, two essay collections looking at kaiju and zombie uh, film and media. So I'm um, going coming to a summary here. Um, here are some examples of literary theory. Uh, as you can see from these terms, some are referring to very specific groups of people, very specific um, points in time. Um, some are referring to broad movements where you can't even really point to a particular person as in charge of it, right? That's kind of even transhistorical, you know, not, not even connected to a um, particular period. So, like the, the the Russian formalists refer to um, a group of scholars. Well, you know, Viktor Shlosky is a Russian formalist who I'm really um, into. Uh, they uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk more about Russian formalists later, but um, this refers to 1920s and 30s movement in um, uh, Russian literary criticism. New criticism refers to a group of American uh, literary critics, specifically um, from the South. They wanted to reorient focus onto uh, the text itself. They uh, pioneered um, concepts like the intentional fallacy, uh, the affective fallacy. Um, you know, lot. You know, um, we we could say all sorts of things about about um, new criticism, but they basically are nineteen uh, late twenties, early thirties. Um, uh, you know, American scholars. Practical criticism refers to nineteen thirties and forties British scholars. Chicago School of Neo Aristotelianism. Psychoanalytical literary criticism. This is a good one we could talk about, which is. It refers to um, literary critics who are interested in um, uh, psychoanalysis, like um, ideas that were at first developed for clinical practice, for helping people deal with psychological pathologies. Freud, um, Carl Jung, uh, Jacques Lacan. These these are ideas that were supposed to help people with with psychological problems, right? Literary cr critics find those ideas interesting and they apply it to literary texts, and that's still going on today. Uh, Marxist literary criticism. Uh, basically, Marx's ideas um, treat all sorts of topics. Um, uh, he just, of course, mostly uh, the economy, right, and then political economy specifically. But he does make a lot of uh, comments on um, uh, literature and art and film. Um, not, not, not film, but before his time, literature, art. You know how how these um, religion, you know, cultural productions like religion. How how these we've heard from opiate of the masses. How these things work to kind of reproduce. Um, uh, he would use the term um, base, the base of an economy, right? The relationship between um, things like our our need to reproduce life um, plays out in the cultural um, uh, text that we create. So people have applied Marx, and Marx has an entire um, you know intellectual um, tradition associated with him. So all of these different ideas um, after Marx that, that comment on Marx are also being applied to literature. Uh, queer theory. Um, so uh, Michel Foucault. Arguably, it might have started this. Um, maybe some people will look at. Um, well, there's all sorts of people who are who are behind queer theory. I don't want to give the sense that uh, Foucault is the main, um, you know, person behind it. But basically, uh, philosophical analysis of the origins of sexual identity, um, gender, and uh, e e even though these um, f philosophers and theorists are, are talking about something that doesn't seem like it has to do with literature, they end up apply, You know, liter critics apply it to literature. The same with a. Uh, Feminist literary criticism. This is a, there's a whole school of uh, I would say like activist um, uh, literary criticism. African American studies is one. Well, ob obviously Marx literary criticism would be a form of activist literary uh, criticism. But uh, um, this is just an example of of, of the different schools. Um, our class will be working our way through specific schools and um, looking at their history and how it when you when you kind of are hewing to one of these schools, you start to see different things in texts. Mm -hmm.
So um, here are some examples of uh, um, what I would say literary theory. Um, and once again, literary theory, it's, it's a label that is applied to works and not one that is, um, you know, like when Sigmund Freud wrote The Interpretations of Dreams, he did not say to himself, I'm writing a work of literary theory, not at all. He was, he was uh, proposing a theory to help with clinical practice, right? Helping people with, with but, but some people will now refer to The Interpretation of Dreams as, as, as literary theory, right? Um, it's literary theory because we're using it as literary theory, not because it was created. Dialectic of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno, um, their work is, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, political philosophy, Marxist analysis. It's uh, a lot of people have applied their ideas to literature. Uh, Derrida of grammatology. Um, once again, um, you know, it's a, uh, the, the philosophy is deconstruction. It's a, it's a practice, it's how, how you approach certain texts. But, um, you know, this is very, uh, there's a whole school called the Yale School of Deconstruction. Um, where uh, they, uh, these uh, literary scholars were en enamored of, of, of Derrida's ideas and applied it to literature. And so we have deconstructive, deconstructionist literary criticism. So final thoughts. Let my vocal cords rest for a second. Literary theory is often seen as a phase in the history of literary criticism. Um, literary theory is an intellectual development that emerges in the post-war period, particularly in the 60s. Obviously, people are going to argue about that, but Literary theory as a discourse doesn't show up until the 60s. Uh, and it's part of that whole um, milieu of like the student revolts, anti-Vietnam revolts, like a lot of like uh, um, anti-authoritarian, um, you know, like cultural uh, tensions, right? Literary theory comes out of that moment. Um, literary theory does not always aim to illuminate literary texts. Instead, some literary theory uses uh, text to intellectually engage other related issues and sometimes activist related issues. Um, feminism, African American studies, psychoanalysis, Marxism, philosophical reflection. Uh, literary theorists, um, they're oftentimes they're in literary um, you know, studies departments or departments of English, but they're not always trying to tell you what Shakespeare means, right? They're, they're dealing with other issues, right? Sometimes these um, literary theoretical uh, enterprises spin out and they create their own departments. There are women's studies departments and African American studies departments now. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, and then a literary theory is an academic enterprise. Um, so it's, uh, you know, uh, it's your, and I guess I, I should just keep, keep, keep going, theory is uh, contrasted against practice, right? When we do literary criticism, we're drawing upon theory to help us practice literary criticism, right? Literary theory is something that is, it, it, it doesn't always have a, have an, um, an object that it's in, like a, um, uh, it's, it's complicated. Literary theorists can be doing all sorts of things, right? Um, literary theorists aren't necessarily illuminating a text. They're, you know, you have, you have to take them each at, on their own uh, terms, right? What what is Derrida doing? What is Freud doing? What is Marx doing? Right? These these, um, you know, it's not as simple as they're they're talking about uh, Shakespeare, right? They're they might they might randomly mention Shakespeare, but literary theorists aren't necessarily talking about about uh, literature. Um, literary critics, though, will use theory in order to talk about literature. So, all right, well, that's a part one of the introduction. Um, lots of information. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good day.